the Chinese stock market's a strange beast, Tom. Um, uh, I think it's a, important to keep in mind a couple of things. Uh, the first is that there's a signal there. The fact that China's stocks are amongst the worst performing in the world this year is a gauge of the weakness in China's economy. Um, at the same time, it's important to remember that China's stock market, whilst kind of symbolic of the economy, is not the economy. There's not a lot of household wealth in the stock market. Right. Businesses aren't raising a lot of capital by issuing shares. So yes, this is scary. Yes, right. this is a bad sign. Yes, this is why Xi Jinping himself, we hear, is planning to intervene. Um, but it's not right. quite the catastrophe for China that it would be if in the United States okay. the S&P 500 was down so much. Right now, we're clearing a market in New York City. It's called Office Towers. And, you know, we have a whole process, bankruptcy or transactions, whatever, to clear. They don't have that structure. How does a totalitarian regime clear a distressed market? So it's a really interesting question, Tom. Um, and actually, I, I don't want to sound too kind of Pollyanna, everything's fine about this. Um, but part of the problem here, part of the short-term pain, is that China is moving to get rid of that problem of moral hazard, get rid of that problem that investors believe that the government, in the final analysis, will stand behind all the banks, stand behind all the real estate developers, and prevent them from failing. It's the removal of that implicit guarantee, which is actually one of the big causes of stress and pain in China's market and economy right now, um, but when they get through the end of it, and it's going to be a long process, we think the property correction still has a couple more years to run. An economy and markets without such a severe moral hazard problem, well, hopefully it will be an economy and a market which is primed to grow and rise again. Hey, Tom, I know President Xi and other Chinese leaders over the last six months or so have been courting Western investors, Western countries, uh, kind of arguing about or supporting the investment thesis for China. But there are a lot of investors, not just EM investors, who are saying China is uninvestable because of the China risk, the government risk. Do you sense that is, is a, that the government of China understands that and that they're willing to make any types of changes to be more receptive to Western investment? So the China investment story has got, I think, three really big problems. Um, the first big problem is that we've gone from an economy which in nominal dollar terms was growing about 20% a year to an economy which in nominal dollar terms isn't growing at all. Um, that's significant negative for investors. Um, the second is relations with the United States. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you put your money in China, there wasn't that geopolitical risk. Now there's the risk of tariffs, the risk of sanctions, the risk of political blowback. The third challenge, as you mentioned, Paul, is that investors now believe that Beijing doesn't have their back, right? Um, and I think it's that piece of it which Xi and his premier uh, and other members of China's leadership are now trying to row back from. The trouble is those other two negatives, falling growth, increased geopolitical stress, they're still there. And that means the mood music remains pretty uh, pretty challenging. And what's the expectation, Tom? I, I kind of think about, I guess, what's the expectation that this Chinese economy can fundamentally turn itself around? I think of, you know, just the demographics of China just don't bode well for the economy longer term. And I'm wondering, you know, what can the government do to really turn this economy around? So when I think about China right now, um, I think about a really significant negative in the real estate sector, and I think about a really significant positive signal in the electric vehicle space, mm, right? Okay. Real estate right. is collapsing. We can't sort of put lipstick on the pig. They've got massive overcapacity there. It's going to be painful as they work through that. Um, but this too shall pass, right? By 2025, 2026, they'll be through the worst of this property correction. The electric vehicle story, I think what that speaks to is China's longer term potential. China's economic miracle from 1980 till today, it's not been based on real estate. It's been, moved, it's been based on moving up the value chain right. from textiles to <clears throat> toys to leadership in 
high-speed trains, sustainable energy, and now electric vehicles. Um, and it's that story which, if it's sustained, means that China's economic miracle, while yeah. not what it was, is also not over. But to, to clear the market, and let's assume they, you know, as they've done before, they just write mm -hmm. off, refund. Where's the money come from to, to mm -hmm. bail out the property market? Do they just print renminbi? Is it that simple? So um, I think there's a couple of things to say here, uh, Tom. The first is that uh, China is a high-saving society with yeah. a closed financial system. Um, and what that means is that the banks are almost always really well-funded. Um, think about the Lehman collapse in 2008, where money fled from the big banks in the United States. That's just not going to happen in China. Um, so that sort of funding crisis issue isn't going to be an issue for Beijing. 